So can we find um, biomarkers from eye movements that can um, predict Alzheimer's disease? So what is eye tracking? Um, so eye tracking is where we um, record people's eye movements whilst they're looking at a computer screen in order to um, see where they're looking. And um, if we have experimental tasks on that screen, then we can manipulate those tasks and learn a bit about people's underlying cognitive processes as they're looking on a computer screen. So current technology uses infrared cameras that shine into people's eye, measure the reflections off the back, and we can pinpoint exactly where someone is looking on the screen. Um, eye movement research has evolved over the years. Um, so when people first started doing eye movement research, they, the experimenter would sit and look into the eyes of a uh, participant and um, learn about underlying cognitive processes by just watching their eye movements alone. Um, they realized that that wasn't too interesting. So the experimenter then started sitting behind the participant and they'd place their fingers on the eyeballs and um, you could feel then if the eye was moving left or right, um, and um, um, they could learn about underlying cognitive processes that way. Unfortunately, we can't get that through ethics very often anymore, um, but the technology has caught up. Um, in the 60s, they started using video cameras, which would record people's eye movement gazes, but then um, nowadays, what we use is infrared eye trackers, which shine infrared light into people's eyes. And this is the top of the range eye link one that we use now. And that's my eye at the bottom of the screen there with the, the way that the camera um, guesses where you're looking on the screen, calculates where you're looking on the screen. So um, in the 60s, when eye movement research really took off, um, someone called Yarbus did a really famous study of eye movements, one of the first pioneers of eye movement research, um, and he wanted to understand if you could predict underlying cognitive states just by looking at people's gaze patterns alone. Um, so in this experiment, he had a uh, piece of artwork that he displayed for participants, and in that artwork contained uh, some um, um, interaction scene. So it's just a man walking into a room here. And Yarbus would ask people a number of different questions about that scene and then trace the eye movement patterns afterwards. So one of the questions that they might ask is, remember the clothes that people were wearing? And you get a distinct scan path for that, um, for that question. Um, or if you were to be asked, give the ages of people in the picture, then you'd get a different scan path. And what Yarbus suggested was, if we could learn to interpret these scan paths alone, then we would be able to understand what the person was thinking about at the time. We could use these scan paths to read someone's mind. Um, nowadays, uh, we can use machine learning to actually do that very thing. So by analyzing these types of scan paths or circadian eye movements and things, then uh, we can predict cognitive states. Um, we can identify what type of task the person was being asked to do and therefore what they were, what they were uh, thinking about. So what I wanted to do in my research was um, understand whether we could use this to predict cognitive decline. So if we can understand cognitive states by looking at eye movement, could we then predict cognitive decline by looking at impairments in these eye movements? So people often think of dementia as being um, a memory issue, but um, one of the first um, problems that we find with people with dementia is that their inhibitory control is affected first. So we can use eye movement for measuring inhibitory control. And we do that with a anti-saccade task, um, which is this task in the bottom corner here. And this is where you put a salient piece of information on the screen, like a little colored circle, and you tell your participant not to look at it, but look the opposite way. So this is a, a distracting piece of um, information because you want to look at it, because it's just appeared on your screen, but you're told to look the other way. So we can measure inhib inhibition by looking at um, people's ability to perform the task, i.e. look away from the little colored circle. So in this study, um, we wanted to look at um, whether we could use these eye movements to predict Alzheimer's disease. So rather than just look at Alzheimer's disease and, and controls alone, we wanted to look at a group of mild cognitive impairment too. So we've got NHS to um, allocators, MCI, Alzheimer's disease and adult control participants, and by Using these um, participants, we could see if mild cognitive impairment could lead to, which often leads to Alzheimer's disease, if we find these 
we wanted to see if we could find these deficits within mild cognitive impairment. Um, so um, we then, out this 89 mild cognitive impairment in participants, what we did was um, do some cognitive tests in order to um, um, subcategorize these mild cognitive impairment participants into amnesic mild cognitive impairment, well, people with memory problems and non-amnesic mild cognitive impairment who don't necessarily have um, a strong memory problem. So we had four groups of participants, um, amnesic mild cognitive impairment, non-amnesic, Alzheimer's disease and older adult controls. So we use the traditional memory tasks that are often used for um, uh, in memory clinics for looking at dementia and um, deciding if someone's got mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease or not. And we use these to help us with the subcategorization process. So we use the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Span tasks, um, a memory task called the Free Cued Selective Reminding Task. And then we did a number of eye movement tasks as well. So with the anti-saccade, we tell people to look away from the little target. Um, but what we measure then is um, people's ability to do the task in terms of their latencies, how long um, it takes them to, to perform the task, how long it takes them to move their eyes to the opposite side of the screen. We can also measure um, uncorrected errors as well. So if, if we were to do this task, what we'd do is um, we'd get it right most of the time, we'd be able to look away from this little colored circle, but sometimes we'd make mistakes. Um, when, we, when we make mistakes, so we correct for it, we would make our eye movement towards the circle, but then we'd correct for it and look the other way. What you find with people with um, Alzheimer's disease is they, they don't correct for it. They'll look at the little colored circle and then stare right at it. Um, so these are the main measurements that we were taking. Here's the results from our study here. Um, what we found is in terms of anti saccade latencies that um, Alzheimer's patients were um, slower to respond than um, controls. Equally, um, amnesic mild cognitive impairment also showed these delayed latencies, um, whereas non-amnesic mild cognitive impairment did not. Uh, in fact, the Alzheimer's patients and the amnesic mild cognitive impairment, there was no statistical difference between them, showing that um, they, were, they had the same type of latencies um, deficits. Um, we observe the same pattern of results with uncorrected errors. So um, we find more uncorrected errors in Alzheimer's disease and amnesic mild cognitive impairment than the, the other two groups. Um, here's another way of representing that data. So these are comet plots. Um, so on one axis, we have horizontal gaze position. Um, so the task, the anti saccade task requires you to just look left and right. We're not interested in up and down. So if we map that onto a chart like this with time along the bottom, then we can see people's um, eye movements. So here at zero, which is where people were fixating at the start of a trial, this is control participants here, they're staring at the center of the screen, and then the target would appear um, maybe to the right-hand side, say, and the participant then would have to correct for that and look this way. So the better the pattern over here, the sooner we see this, type of pattern, this represents good eye movement, performing the task well. Um, and um, the longer this comet tail and this comet tail are, represents um, poorer performance. And as you can see with um, the amnesic mild cognitive impairment and the Alzheimer's patients, that they've got really long tails here, which means that there's longer latencies. So it takes them longer to react to the um, appearance of the circle. Um, and also um, they're making more uncorrected errors where they're just staring right at the little circle. So conclusions, so the anti saccade task, AS task enables us to make broad group distinctions, Alzheimer's patients and amnesic mild cognitive impairment. Um, patients are impaired and there's evidence there of a disease effect rather than age. Performance on the anti saccade task is associated with the memory performance as well, the memory variables that we took. So more anti saccade errors is associated with poorer memory. Um, therefore, after a mild cognitive impairment diagnosis, if anti saccade performance is impaired, then amnesic mild cognitive impairment is more likely, which can lead to an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So, if you you're more likely to, if you've got if you perform poorer on the task, then um, um, I, amnesic mild cognitive impairment is more likely, and amnes this could then lead on to. Alzheimer's disease, you're more likely to get Alzheimer's disease then because we found that the results were analogous. Um, so it seems like you can use the anti-saccade task 
to predict Alzheimer's disease. Okay.